um, thank you very much. Um, I have some slides which probably you won't find very helpful. There are only four, one of which is a list of my collaborators on a project relating to <coughs> climate compatible development, another one of which is a map of some of the countries where we've worked, another is a list of references. So for those who aren't here, who are listening online, apologies, but if you want to have notes from what I say, you're going to have to take notes. Uh, so um, I find this issue of climate compatible development extraordinarily challenging. And uh, Sam asked me just before we came in <coughs> whether or not I was still a climate compatible development skeptic. And I answered, yes, I am, but at least I'm not a climate compatible denier. <laughs> and I recognize that there may be merits in this notion, but until we understand it a lot, a lot better, I don't think that I can articulate exactly what those merits might be. And I'm not sure whether we should be pushing this as a policy when we're uncertain of the true implications of climate compatible development. So I would argue that we need to take a step back and think about the lack of empirical evidence that we have and perhaps set about some framing questions that we should be asking when we think about climate compatible development. So the first um, question I would ask is what initiatives generate climate compatible development? Do we have any robust evidence? I recognize that we don't have policies that are um, articulating climate compatible development, but there are many policies that currently exist, and I'd like to mention a few of those, um, which we can evaluate in terms of their contribution to climate compatible development. I think that's where we start. I think we then need to ask, is climate compatible development more cost effective than pursuing adaptation, mitigation and development separately? Does climate compatible development, in it, do co climate compatible development initiatives produce more than the sum of the parts? And if they don't, why are we doing them? Um, if, if they do, what is it that is unique and different about climate compatible development that means that we should pursue this as a policy objective. Um, if we do decide, this is my final question, if we do decide that we are pursuing climate compatible <coughs> development, how can we rank or compare the relative merits of the different projects or policies or initiatives which are purporting to deliver climate compatible development? And I would argue that we actually don't have answers to many of those questions at the moment, and that until we have robust answers to them, I would be a little bit reluctant to pursue this. I'd like to provide a little bit of insight into um, the first question on what initiatives generate climate compatible development. I've been involved with um, colleagues in a CDK and funded project over the past two years. Uh, there's a working paper it's called An Investigation into the Evidence of Benefits from Climate Compatible Development, Tompkins et al, 2013, and the reference is on my last slide. Uh, there we go, for anybody who wants to, to write it down. Um, which, uh, well, you don't have to. Um, which is, uh, sorry. We'll, we'll post the slides. Lovely, thank you. Um, so in, in that, it documents um, four uh, um, uh, empirical examples of policies which are being undertaken in four countries, in coastal areas, in Kenya, Belize, Vietnam, and Ghana, um, and policies which are being undertaken in the coastal zone relating to agriculture, aquaculture, tourism, forestry, and fisheries, not with a specific aim to deliver climate compatible development, but simply policies that are being pursued in those areas. <coughs> and we have evaluated them to try and understand whether they are generating climate compatible development. Um, we used a participatory methodology and there is um, a working paper that should be out in the next week which is the King et al reference on the reference list um, which describes in detail the methodology that we used. Uh, instead of going into the, the nuances of what we did, I thought I would just present some of the core findings from this analysis of projects, policies, and initiatives in these four countries. Um, the first finding was that we triple wins exist, which is uh, reassuring, or climate compatible development clearly does exist, um, but it tends to only occur when there's an initial policy focus on some aspect of climate change, whether that's adaptation or mitigation. 
when we're pursu pursuing development-focused policy agendas, it's very rare to generate the, the, the triple wins. You might get your co-benefits, which is your intersection between mitigation and adaptation. It might be low carbon development, where you're conserving energy. It might be climate resilient development, uh, where you're getting um, adaptation benefits from development. But you rarely generate the triple wins unless you're focusing on climate change as a starting point. The second key finding is that Almost all of the climate compatible development initiatives that we found came with regrets. So there's a, a document, that there's lists in the back of this paper which summarise what the costs are. And um, I would argue that the costs aren't solely um, uh, accruing to the private sector, but they land on those communities whose land may be used to um, reforest areas with mangroves or to those who have their land used um, in a slightly different way to generate crops, um, or, or even, um, I'm just trying to think of some of the examples. <coughs> it's, uh, in many, many cases, with a lot of the initiatives that were being undertaken, it's a loss of land for um, alternative development or a loss of earnings. And these um, policies are affecting the poorest. They're not affecting um, the wealthy private sector necessarily. So um, we would argue that climate compatible development can come at high costs for developing country communities. And we need to evaluate what these costs are. What are the regrets? The third conclusion is that the local conditions in whatever country it might be determine whether climate compatible development is delivered with or without regrets. So, for example, in two of the countries, we found that mangrove restoration and afforestation was one of these areas where there is the potential for triple wins. Um, in one country, this was without regrets. In another country where they're struggling with land redistribution at present, we found that it came with regrets due to land issues. So, um, I'm, I'm, so I'm apologize for talking about my own project when we're, we're discussing this paper. But I feel that when we talk about the drivers and challenges for climate compatible mm -hmm. development, we have to take that first step back and ask these core questions for which I feel we don't have robust evidence. Um, do you mind if I have a go at answering that question for Obama, mm -hmm. if I have the time in the lift as well? Um, what would I say if he said, you know, should we be pursuing trip, um, climate compatible development or not? Um, I would struggle, I would stare at him, shocked for a moment, realising I could influence the future of our planet, um, and say um, there is the potential for this to have a huge impact, but we don't know enough. And what I would recommend that you do is invest in your climate change mitigation where we know we can have long-term future benefits for our planet, and invest in research and development into climate-compatible development <coughs> to help us understand how we can allocate our limited resources most effectively. Very good. Uh, just listening to you list the issues, we can have a separate discussion about about a number of things in there, but some of those can be turned around into positives. So I mean, what I heard you say was, actually climate compatibility can work really well provided you do a few things. You know, you make sure that you put climate at the heart of the planning, you make sure you think about who the losers might be and compensate them, that you have complementary policies like land redistribution. I mean, is that an unfair way of portraying what you said? No, not at all. Um, there was, and I think in some cases there are there are significant numbers of losers. So, and I, and identifying the spectrum of lo losers is actually quite a big issue. And it might be that the answer to one of the earlier questions I asked, which is what are the additional benefits from do taking joint action (CCD) as opposed to adaptation, mitigation, and development separately, it might be that taking the other route and addressing each of those individually might be the way to go to generate fewer losers. I don't have the answers, and I would be reluctant to guide someone in terms of developing a policy until we have those answers. Okay, that's helpful. There are obviously questions that need to be looked at. Now, we're going to hear a voice from Colombia, and as I said earlier, Claudia Martinez, who has been um, <coughs> an advisor to the government of Colombia, a deputy minister, I think, is going to tell us about what the drivers are and how she overcame some of the challenges in Colombia. <laughs> 